coaches. Thanks for joining me for another Modern Soccer Coach interview. We're joined again today by Ali Bain, Academy coach and founder of Insight Analysis on the link below. We're going to talk about the classic discussion results versus development from a coaching perspective in this chat. Hope you enjoy it. Please like and subscribe before we start. More interviews, more video breakdowns, more tactical analysis, more sessions coming. Please subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. Ali, thanks so much for joining me again on the Modern Soccer Coach. Regular spot now, eh? <laughs> so join the big time. No, I'm a pleasure to be here, mate, as always. What'd you get up to at the weekend, football wise? I've been, um, so as part of the, the, the insight analysis, I've been working with a couple of different clubs, a couple of different programs. I was watching some games this weekend from uh, Division One Women's College Soccer and all the way down to U13 Boys. MLS next, so it's been a real broad range, but um, but I had some really good performances this weekend, so it's been real fun putting together the uh, the game reviews. Right, so you got some clients on the hook then, makes the weekends interesting? Yes, exactly. Speaking of coaches is always fun as well. You get one coach who's devastated, they've lost, and the other coach is on top of the world because they've got a victory, so it's um, so aye, it makes me want to get back out there coaching sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, it bring, <laughs> brings us along nicely for this week's topic, the ups That's and downs sick. of, yeah, because in the college, we talked about a little bit about college last week where, yeah, you've you've got this, they all, like, today we're all, we've all got game models and we've all, you know, tactically, I, I genuinely believe that the landscape today in coaching, people are trying to integrate analysis, game models, development models all together, but God, when you've got that weekend of two matches sometimes and the bullets are flying, it's hard, isn't it? Oh, exactly. You know, and, and it's it's one of them where this is really where it, it tests, you know, your ability as a human being, right, really, in those instances, right? Because the football's done, the, the coaching's done of the week, your preparation's done, obviously you're living in your, you know, sort of stream of consciousness as to where you make decisions during the game. But then you've got the playing time piece, you've got expectations, maybe you've got, uh, even at the college level, you get administrators wanting good performances. Is that going to impact your ability to recruit down the road? So there's um, there's a lot going on, obviously, as you know, in, in football. Very rarely is it just the X's and the O's. Yeah. When when you're doing that role then as an analyst and, and you're supporting those coaches, you're almost then a little bit of psychologist as well, right, on the on the on the review side where you're trying to to give them a little bit of a 360 view and i'm sure emotionally those coaches are still in the sure. trenches of where they are emotionally it's difficult exactly and listen a lot a lot of the, the time when you're when you're uh, you're doing the reviews right you're in that sort of privileged position in that you're able to deliver a message completely you know free of any emotion because you don't know the players right i'm not there every day but that's then a good thing because I can then look at it with clear eyes and say, okay, here's just what I see rather than taking on board all of the times that players did X, Y, and Z for me in the past that I would maybe have as a head coach. So when you're, when you're delivering messages, um, I think that's where, you know, a lot of coaches need to rely. And, and by the way, they don't always have assistant staff, but having other eyes and ears that watch your team play, I think is invaluable. And certainly something I didn't draw enough on um, when I was, you know, when I was coaching, so I certainly think that now that I'm doing this, it's something I'll integrate moving forward myself when I, when I take a team again. Uh, all right, moving moving nicely into this week's topic of results versus development at youth level. If I've got one of these emails, I must have got a hundred over the last, you know, couple of years, even where coaches are looking for a bit of advice on, hey, listen. Again, building X, Y, and Z takes time. And we all know it takes time, even at the highest level with a big checkbook, it takes time. But everyone wants something yesterday in today's world. And the football world seems to be boys with that type right. of thinking. This is, I I'm, mean, I'm like it's a stupid question, but this is obviously something that you've seen as well or, or, or heard. Of course. And, and listen, I think. Whenever we talk about this, right, through the lens of what's what's right for clubs, what's right for teams, what's right for coaches, that answer we can only give theoretically, right? Because we don't know your situation, we don't know your circumstances, we don't know your environment. But I think the most important thing that I've taken away, certainly through the years I've been doing this, is if you cut corners to achieve anything, you're not going to achieve it. 
So if that's cutting corners to get a victory on a weekend, if that's cutting corners to maybe even just try and get an individual performance against an individual team, you're going to come up against it. So I think having that long-term view um, is important because ultimately you need to sell that to your players and in turn then sell it to the, again, I mentioned the college level administration, whether it's the parents that sign up for your team, whether it's the other coaches that you're working with, you're always in sales mode because it's never going to be perfect, right? There's never going to be, well, we just steamroller everyone. And by the way, if you are in an environment where you're winning most weeks, I'd argue as well, you've got a bigger challenge there to maintain that level so you're not getting complacent. Yeah, we'll get on to that about what winning kind of does in the negative as well. You know, that's the mm-hmm. it's the holy grail that when you get there, uh, it comes with a lot of challenges and, and personal development issues. But on those shortcuts, what, what would you deter? How would you give an example of a coach taking a shortcut at the youth level on a weekend? Well, it's, it's watching, for example, how a Premier League team would approach a big game, right? So, for example, Newcastle are going to play at, you know, Anfield and they need to play a certain way to win a game of football, right? For their club, their supporters, for the finances, for the revenue, the whole deal. When you're going out and coaching under 14 boys or under 12 girls, you're not Newcastle going to Anfield to get result, right? It may in your head sometimes it may feel like that. But ultimately cutting corners and again, we all know what that sort of looks like, right? Whether it be time wasting or be slowing the game down, whether it just be sort of um, you know, I almost call it this over professionalization, right? I see kids now that, you know, the ball rolls out and it's like they're kicking the ball away in the parking lot, or you know, they're falling over and you know they're not hurt, but it's like they've saw a lad do it on the TV, so now I need to do that, you know. And, and I think that's where we have to be really careful that we're not um looking at this as a, as a truly live or die, you know, environment. Yes, it's important to us, but how we win games of football at youth level is not the same as how we win games at professional level, that they are two different worlds apart. Uh, and listen, that's not me being righteous. That's not me being saying, well, my teams don't do that because, you know, it's football, right? It's real life and everyone needs to needs to get results. But I think that's what, when I talk about cutting corners, if you as a coach are imprinting that, then I think it's got a very short lifespan that um, very quickly it becomes a bit of a toxic environment if, you, if that's something that you're, you know, trying to oversee. I completely agree with you. Sometimes we think we are at Premier League ground and sometimes nobody cares, but everyone, you're the, we talked about this last week, sometimes mm-hmm. the, the pressure you have in your head can be, can be just as much as thousands of people in, mentally. How much pressure do you think is on in 2023 is on a youth coach at, I'll go mid-tier, like U12, U14, how much pressure from their bosses is there mm-hmm. at clubs, do you think, to win games? I would say, I think let's try and define the pressure piece for a second, because I think the answer is yes, there is pressure, right? And I think this is where you've got to dis- differentiate certain organisations. There's some organisations where the pressure comes from, are you just been a good guy? Are you just been a good person? Like, do the, do the families like you as a person? You know, certainly in American youth soccer, they're paying a lot of money and there's a lot of time and energy go into, you know, you being a thing, right? Even just earning a salary from being a coach. So are you taking care of business on that side? And then there are other organizations where, you know, even at that sort of mid-tier level, where they see winning tournaments, you know, winning league games, getting far in state cups and all these different events as, as being really important. So I think as a, as a coach, you need to know that going into it because it changes the rules of the game, right? How you interact with your players, yes, has to be the same in all environments. But if my challenge is I have to win X amount of games, then that's a completely different relationship I'm having with players where I've got a little bit more free reign, a bit more of a sort of longer term um, sort of development time to work with them. But to go back to your original question, Gary, is, is there pressure on coaches? There absolutely is. And I think that's where even as leaders, you know, whether a director of coaching or a technical director of a club, that's where you have to be careful how you frame that first conversation on Monday morning. So even down to the, did you win at the weekend? It could be, 
how did they play at the weekend? Did the kids have a good time? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, even even just looking at purely on that level, that's where it starts for me, and it starts a snowball rolling, where you know you could have the greatest game in a weekend, lose a game two one. Like, we don't show up for that last minute, right? And to find out the result, we're there for the whole game, so it's it's the whole game you have to think about. Um, so yeah, I think we're if, if we're not careful, I think we're in danger of that sort of running away from itself and as, as maybe taking a bit of a focus off what it is we're, we're here for. Does the DOC, you mentioned there about leadership, I find that really interesting. So say you're at a big club, you're a DOC and you're taking a team and you've got maybe five coaches in that age group and you get in on the Monday morning. Is there that added pressure on that DOC that their team has to win because they're the leader almost? There can be, and certainly again, this goes back to the group of people that you surround yourself with, right? If you feel like you live vicariously through children's performances, then you know you you've probably got bigger issues, right? If you if you're at one with yourself and you understand the scenario, I think this is where again we can start to try and justify things, and it's where you hear a lot of the times about well, the referee the stinker and this happened and this kid didn't show up, and you start the excuse culture, which again I go back to that that very quickly snowballs into players starting to do that. And all of a sudden it's no one's fault apart from someone else's. So again, I think that pressure that you speak of there is on all of us, right? We're all competitive. That's, that's why, that's why you put your name forward to do this, right? And that's why the kids put their name forward to play in it. But again, it's, it's, it's so important that you're protective over that because we've all been in those environments where, you know, you don't want the opposite. You don't want the no one really cares. Everyone just showing up. This is a bit of a sort of holiday camp because that's not good either. <laughs> so it's just against it's keeping everyone. Um, you know, you hear a lot now. This phrase alignment. Alignment for me means that basically what we're working towards. And your team at U fourteens might be working towards something completely different from my team at U sixteen. Um, therefore, you know, we have to keep that in perspective. And they can go together. That's the other thing. Like they're not mutually mm-hmm. exclusive, right? You can develop, and it's not a lin- success isn't a linear model, but exactly. you can make progress and develop. Exactly, and I, again, this is you know I, I use this phrase a lot, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but this is where I think we're we're maybe losing our way a little bit as coaches, right? Because again, we compare ourselves to to the, the Premier League, the style of play, for example, for a for a Brighton right, produces results because, again, they're professional footballers. If we imprint that style on a youth team and they lose every week, right, they're not getting any results, that also isn't development either, right? So, again, we have to look at here the, you know, use that phrase here, they're not mutually exclusive. Playing style and results have to marry together, right? You're, You're playing to get a result. That's the point of it. This isn't an art project, right? We're not trying to make 75 passes to to get a pat on the back. You're trying to do it to score a goal. And again, I think that's where the competitive piece here is. I go back to what I said earlier about cutting corners. I think there's a lot of teams that would quite happily sort of sacrifice any style, just any sort of um, chance of making a mistake at all to win 2-0 because that's that's the goal. That's the be on the end all rather than producing a style or even just producing a way of playing that complements your players. What what are your players capable of and can we get the most out of them? Hello coaches, you asked and we delivered. One of the most popular requests we get on this channel is passive warm-ups and it's not the regular slow way to be passing exercises. No, what coaches are looking for is the one-touch intricate combination type exercises with that emphasis on quality, technique and tempo. So we have decided to put 30 of these exercises together and release them on an ebook that you can get access to right away. If you're a youth coach who's looking for some extra technical work or you're even a college coach or a club coach working with older players looking for some warm-up exercises or some pictures to align with your tactical objectives, we can help you out. Our new ebook, 30 Passing Practices, is available on the link below. It's a PowerPoint that includes video, session details, and coaching points on each slide. Tons of ideas, tons of different pictures, lots of adaptions. You can get it on the link below or at modernsoccercoach.com slash shop. Thanks for the support and enjoy.
brings us along nicely to what is that then? What what do you think? All right, you've you've got the two 0 performance. Mm-hmm. You're a DOC. What do you want to see from a development standpoint? What boxes tech do you want to see from performance to go along with that result? Well, I guess the first thing for me is always: Are the players being challenged? Are they being pushed? Right, I see a lot of this. I saw a game at the weekend. There's a, a boy playing under 13s football who had no business playing new 13s football. Just a very talented boy, physically dominant, should be challenged by playing up. But again, with, with all of the, the stigma around that, is it the right environment for the kid? Does he get any pals on that team? I know that's complicated, but are the, are the players getting challenged even within a, a situation that, let's say you're a fullback and they're great defensively, the back line doesn't concede goals, but they never leave their half. Are we challenging them to get forward and put crosses in or even just try and pass the ball <laughs> before it's sailing 70 yards up the field down the line for a striker? Um, conversely as well, it could be the changing of positions. If you know a kid's an, an amazing left winger who's who's going to be a you know a college athlete, let's say under 17s, and you know he's going to be a left, put him in the right wing, try to say something different. So again, that there could be a time where that you know, going into a college environment, the coach says, Listen, I need a left back. If if that's his first time ever doing that, then maybe as a as a coach, sometimes you can, you know, try and fabricate those situations or certainly engender those situations where they're being tested. And I think if there's more of the players being tested, I think that now puts that performance into perspective that this isn't just a simple passing pattern game of you know moving the ball around you're actually putting them in situations where we've been challenged internally. Like I've put challenges on you as footballers and you've exceeded by going out and and making it happen. So much of that goes on the coach because there is a, the the comfort zone of that 2-0 win on a Saturday morning kind of gets you the box ticked Mm -hmm. where, you know, if you're going to mess with your team, then you're, you've got coaches then thinking, that's more, coaching I'm going to have to do yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that well unless I think there's a, there's a comfort piece right to, we, you know, we talk about players feeling comfortable in positions there's a comfort from a coach's perspective exactly. right whether yeah. you know I, I do this on a game day this is my warm up this is how we run this is the subs and, and everything's sort of predetermined until something happens and all of a sudden that's when you, you the test now is how quickly everyone goes into panic mode. Oh, geez, what, what do I have to change? Who am I going to have to upset here? You see environments where, um, you know, being a, a playoff scenario or a tournament scenario where, well, start the tournament, or everyone's getting on the field, come the final, well, these are the 11 players and I'm not changing, you know? And I think that's where, again, we have to remember what this is. And, and listen, there's some environments, let's say you're a professional uh, you know, professional academy and it's under 17s and you've went to a tournament in a different country to go play football, there is no obligation to play anyone. You're a professional footballer, you're being paid to be there. But if you're coaching under 11s who have travelled five hours to go play in a tournament, it's a little bit different now, right? It's the, the, the rules are they're different, they're, they're not the same, even though, again, internally, we might feel that we have to win the same. Yeah, is there's always a knock on the U.S. landscape as being results-focused. Mm-hmm. Do you think, you mentioned there, watching the games for, for inside analysis over the game, were you watching matches that were result mentality from both <laughs> teams? I, I would argue, even at the top level, and again, I'm watching Division One college soccer, and I'm watching the MLS Next, which again, in this country, is the, the, the highest level you can play on the boys' side. Uh, or again, in terms of the pyramid, what they would regard it as. And I would argue probably 25% of the players are fully engaged in winning the game. And, and what I mean by that is when they go into tackle, it does not a sort of, well, I'm, I'll show the coach that I'm going to press the ball here. My life depends on this challenge. And I think that it's those little details that I think we're missing out in analysis now. And we're looking rightly at the big picture, rightly the tactics and the technique and those things, but what it really means to the players 
is I think something that we've maybe lost our way a little bit. And listen, it's, it's not easy to spot it, but you know it when you see it, right? And again, I'll even say in the college level, there's a lot of a lot of tired people right now in college soccer, whether it be there's a lot of travel going on, there's a lot of, you know, they're, they're students at the end of the day, they're doing this part-time, right? There's a lot of fati- mental fatigue going on. They're taking a lot of information on board. So now really is your opportunity as an analyst and even as a coach to see, does this really matter? And again, if you have a, a, a higher volume, a higher population of those people on your side, then I think that's when we can really start talking about the winning versus the, the competition piece. Because I get really only then, if, if it matters to you more as a coach than it does your players, then you've got a problem. Yeah. Oh, I mean, th- this is really interesting. I mean, I see that there. I see the, I, I see us being outcome focused. Mm-hmm where we do care about the result because it impacts, you know, the grand view of whether someone's going to be annoyed or criticism right. or feedback. But I don't see that intensity of, I wouldn't mind being results focused if it impacted the process. Right. But I actually think that we're, we're moving away. And that's, that's something that I remember talking to, I think it was Paul Bright at the coach manual a few years ago when he was, he was just back from Spain and he was saying that, they're way more focused on the result than right. we think they are in those countries. Mm-hmm. But, but again, it goes back to though, we, we could have, me and you could take a team and all 18 players could look us in the eye and say, yep, coach, I'm, I'm really into this. I, I really want to win. I absolutely am. But when it really boils down to it, are they? Their actions show you, right? Mm-hmm. So can you, can you create that as a coach? Can you lift people? You know, can you put that into them of course you can I think you can certainly motivate players to do it but this is again where we talk about the again the sort of landscape of things and and really just the level when you dilute things so frequently by creating more opportunities there's there's more clubs there's more players I think you now have a higher chance that that um, competitiveness significantly drops because there's people just happy to be there. They're just happy to take part. Or even when you're in a scenario where you're four up, four up at half time, we see it all the time in, in, in the youth levels. Do they really care in that second half? And I don't mean going out and running the score up. I mean, like, did they visibly still tackle hard? Did they visibly still press? Did they visibly still to get at the back post to score a goal? You know, those are those are all things that I think is is tiny details. As coaches, we have an absolute responsibility to manage them as people. But that's, again, the technical piece. So I think if we start from there, we give ourselves a chance. Yeah, that that diluting, that's a, it's a great word because that's where I see, again, I'm not in the youth world, but but I'm around it. And when I mm-hmm. see, you know, I haven't seen a change in 20 years of the action on the sideline with the, with the parents, you know, it's... Right. They're they're all in, but they're not all in because by the time they jump in the car, you can hear them walking back to the car talking about where they're eating, right? And, you know, and what's next on their schedule. And now I'm becoming a parent. I kind of see what that world is. Mm-hmm. Where, it, hey, soccer from nine to eleven, karate from eleven to yeah. one, <laughs> air at one. <laughs> like. Yeah, I can see why they're so intense because you've got to be six places by six o'clock. Exactly, exactly. And listen, I think it's, you know, we, we both get young kids as well where, like, we're trying to impart that on them that it matters as well, right? We want them to commit, you know, if, if they sign up for something and it's raining out, it's like, no, nah, I don't fancy it tonight. No, no, you're going, like, you know. So so I think there's a, there's a piece of that that they are ultimately our children in the day. But like you said, if it's one of nine appointments on a Saturday... I don't know how they can be successful in anything if that's, you know, uh, if, if that's the case, you know. But, you know, to your point, I know, Gary, about that, and I think a lot about this, right, about the, the Spanish culture, about kids, you know, wanting to win. I hear a lot about people saying, well, they need to watch more soccer, they need to support a team, you know. I, I, I understand all of those things, but there's a, a, a coach I was working with recently um, who was in Senegal, I could even tell you a team in Senegal. I have no idea what the league's like there, but I know there's magnificent footballers who are all in green. Now, obviously, there's a Premier League and there's other clubs that they can get behind. Um, but I wouldn't say that the Senegalese football culture is any different than the 
the apathy in the American one, but one produces world class players and one's you know still getting there. So so I think there's something just inbuilt in as as people um, in our society that maybe you know maybe sort of contrary to what we what we think they should be. It's complex, like so complex, and that's where I guess ties in nicely to the topic results development like it's there's a bit of this and a bit of that there's Mm -hmm. there's success and development where you focus on skills but then if you don't have the mentality and then it's the complexity of we've so much opportunity we've so much access the s and c world over here yet if you don't engage the heart uh, and the brain and all Mm -hmm. these other things then and then we've so much access to psychology but then we have right. so access to non-contextual psychology. So it doesn't exactly. really so like that's that's the piece that I guess from a leadership standpoint, it's understanding or having awareness of what your players need and being realistic about hey, we're winning 2 0 every week. Mm-hmm. I, you know what? I get it that there's the social media piece of, of promoting your club and your players. But if it's a 14-year-old who's been on posts going to this, doing that, oh, I look at that alley and I think, <laughs> oh, no. I tell, I tell you one I really struggle with, and listen, it's one I've been part of clubs that have done it. I'm still part of one that does it now where they put the results out every weekend. And, it, and I struggle with it on a couple of levels, right? Not because kids shouldn't be proud if they win a game or, you know, do well. Or, or, but... If we're if we're looking at the absolute top level, do you know how Real Madrid 14s got on this weekend? Because I don't, I don't know if if the results are anywhere, right? So this idea that if we just put it out there and put it on a website, that we're instantly competitive. I think again, I think we're in we're looking at it the wrong way around, you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, last couple. Um, young coach who's getting in and and is at a club that isn't established and mm-hmm. wants to do it right. But instead of having the bosses, has got 25 uh, Roman Abramovich's on the sideline, <laughs> want the results. And, and how do you think that coach doesn't, or how do you advise that coach not to take the shortcut? Exactly. It's a, it's a tough one. I think as a, as a person walking into that environment, as, a, as we've both done in our lives, you have to have standards, right? And there's times in the past I know, again, you know, growing up in youth soccer, being a young coach myself, um, there are times where, you know, you think, well, if I just did this one thing, this will solve it. Or if I just recruited this one player, this will fix everything. And it doesn't. (laughs) So So there is no one thing. But when I go back to the phrase standards, holding people accountable to their actions and include yourself in that. You know, if you get really, really angry with people one weekend because we haven't won a game and then super over the moon because you have the next. Your players are going to, you know, go through that up and down, as are the parents. You know, we've got a, a culture here. And again, I'm not involved in any other country, so this might be a thing in Britain and Canada and whatnot. I don't know. But in America, there's a big culture of we write an email on the Monday morning, coach spills his life out into that email, what he thought about the game. It's something I actually stopped at our club because I just thought it was completely counterproductive in our environment. And there's other environments where it's very good. But now all of a sudden it becomes like a press release and you've got people quoting that in the future. So again, I, I would encourage people to look at the parent group and anyone who's involved in a team as as important as the players. Keep everyone in, involved because therefore when you set that standard of this is how I act, therefore... This is how to interact with me. Um, you know, if you're fielding 18 calls from all your 18 players every week, then you've got a problem. What is the best way to deal with that? I wasn't aware of that email stuff. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, no, very like much so. 48 hour, don't talk to me. Well, like what type of processes do you put in place to kind of manage that? Well, I, I, listen, I think this is where, you know, sometimes you may have taken on a team where the coach made themselves utterly available to everyone and it's just commonplace that they feel that they can call you. So again, I go back to the standards piece. What works for you? I think if you go into this and 
environment thinking no one can ever question me talk to me communicate with me then you're probably in the wrong game right that you know they're they're very much as a culture certainly in american youth soccer of being I, I would like to be able to contact the coach but i think this is where again goes back to your standards of if, if it's then transactional if it's then you know I've, we've heard that a lot we pay your wages ergo we deserve sit. that's not going to work for, for me either you know i'm, I'm not a you know, I'm not a waiter. I'm not at someone's beck and call. I'm here to do a job for the players and for the, for the organisation. Um, and as a leader as well, as a director of coaching, you have to set those standards. If you just let your coaches do what they want and everyone's different and it's the World West, then, you know, you, you're going to, unfortunately, you're going to create that toxic atmosphere just by doing nothing. All right, you're a DOC. You're a leader. You've got an established club. Um, Coach X is a little bit old school. Coach X is a little bit stale in his or her thinking. Uh, roar and scream and do that. But when at the weekend, every weekend, basically, when you're mm-hmm. hoping, ah, this will catch up to them eventually, and you get their, you know, they're pretty consistent in that regard. How would you deal with that there? I think there has to be an understanding if you're, if you require someone to show empathy towards the players, for example, so if you want your coach to be more empathetic or even just a little bit more cohesive with the team, you have to show that to them. You know, walking in as a leader and screaming and shouting at people or writing emails and not having face-to-face conversations, very quickly people's backs can get up and all of a sudden no one's listening, everyone's, you know, trying to position themselves. So I think the best, you know, Really, the best way to move forward with any environment of, of coaches is setting forth that this is how we interact. This is how I want you to run your team. Again, if that doesn't jive with you, if that's, that doesn't work, that's cool, then we'll, we'll have to find someone else. If you're going through a hiring process of bringing staff in and you also have the opposite scenario where everyone just wants to do exactly what you say and it's very dictatorial of they're not being themselves either, I think you also have problems. So again, it's, it's it's maybe a case of trying to surround yourself with people that are sometimes different, but have the same end goal, right? We don't always have to work the same, but if our end goal is the same, which is the players are developing, you're challenging them, they're feeling like they're you know moving forward as a team, and in turn they're still getting results. Not you know like we've said, it's not, it doesn't have to be the be on the end of the win every game, but if they're losing every game, that's just the same for me. There's a red flag somewhere there that you have to try to solve. And if you don't have a, a coach there that's willing to look introspectively like that, then I think that's, you know, that, that's going to be a tough one for you. Yeah, the the last kind of segment of this will be that, that, that future player or that player going to the next level, which I know a lot of people aspire from a development standpoint, get them to college, get them to maximize their potential at the pro level or whatever it is, which is great. We've got these options now. Obviously, adaptability is, is a part of it. You mentioned earlier about the college coach that's going to have to get them to play in different positions. Like oh, That's almost, I would say, there's 95% chance that player won't play in their position in college. They'll have to play somewhere mm-hmm. else. But then also the mentality piece, if that player is used to winning every week, very, very few college teams win every week. Man United don't even win every three weeks at the minute. Like, uh, how does it, d- does winning, constantly winning, 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 as great as that sounds on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, does, can that be a negative for a player? Listen, 100% can. You know, I, I have first hand examples of this. Uh, a good friend of mine worked at a school in New Hampshire. They had recruited a boy from LA Galaxy's Academy. And they were going back a couple of years before, obviously, there's the, the professional route that there is now for all of these young boys. But at the time, the route was you play academy football and then you go and play college soccer and then get drafted, right? Again, a little bit different now. This boy was the top goal scorer in what would have been the development academy at the time and didn't score a single goal as a freshman in college. Played a lot of the minutes, but his ability to play through adversity. So whether that be in a climate that he wasn't used to, coming from LA, living in New England, uh, defenders defending against him. So in the development academy, there was a lot of past possession. Everyone's, you know, footballers. 
got Division One college soccer. Now you're up against a six foot four, you know, English boy who has no interest in playing football, but has every interest in kicking you up in the air. And I, I go back to that adversity piece because if you can't create that for your players or, or even just show them what it looks like, there is nothing you can say to them that will prepare them for it. You know, they have to live it. They have to breathe it. And sometimes that's maybe a failure of recruitment. If you're looking at, oh, well, this boy's scored a bunch of goals, he'll come in and do that exact same thing for us. Um, you know, maybe sometimes, you know, peel back the layers a little bit and, and, and try and look at, well, performance is one thing, but what does the environment say? What what type of, you know, climate has he been playing in? Uh, I think that's that's something that, you know, as coaches, we need to be very mindful of as well. Yeah, I, I love that there because you're looking at, from a football standpoint, like development of, again, solving football problems. Right. Whereas sometimes, and it's not to go out and lose the game on purpose, right? But it's, no. it's being a little bit more creative in your challenges with that player. Mm-hmm. And, and listen, I, I go back to what I said earlier about the, about the playing up piece. You know, when I very first came to, you know, you saw it in America, everyone wanted to play up. It was like a badge of honour. It was like, well, look, look how good I am as a footballer that I play up in age group. I think what we've done as, as clubs is that we've maybe put kids in a situation where, yes, the, we want the team to be successful, but if it's at the detriment of the footballer, sometimes maybe even a, a game or two, you know, play in different environments, even just training, you know, with, with older players. I think there's sometimes we've maybe incubated a lot of players um, as to, you know, what type of coach they're with or what type of team they're with. I mean, in, in, listen, you'll have experienced this where, you know, a coach takes a team from under nine right through under 18. That's not great either, right? They need to hear different people. You know, we, we've gone about different styles. If, you, if you've got to college or you're a professional player and that's the first time you've had someone doubting you as a player, not being your best friend, like, that's, you know, that, that's a hard, that's a hard pill to swallow for players. And if, um, you know, their entire development has been based around, you're a great player, you're a brilliant player, look how great you are, then, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we need to be horrible to people, but just put them in a situation where they're going to fail, that, that's, that's sometimes a, a good thing as well. Yeah, and then backing that up then with a little bit of video analysis on the, on the back side exactly. of it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Ali, brilliant. Exactly. Great way to finish it. Ali, thanks so much. Um, appreciate you jumping on again. Enjoy Smashing. Scotland. <laughs> appreciate it, mate. Thank you.